and my crew. Um, I, uh, first and foremost, I don't forget, like to thank, of course, um, uh, William and Janet Lightning for this um, support and, uh, you know, for, um, in the School of, of Chemical Sciences and the university for the recognition for my group and for me and for their support of our work. Um, certainly, you know, I think anyone who knows, um, you know, the realm of chemistry knows that I really don't do this work myself or by myself, that we are a team. And I'd like to take a moment now just to tell you, um, although I think uh, Paul really kind of captured what we do so well, I want to tell you a little bit about what we do and actually who we are as a group. So as uh, Professor Rickenbacker said, um, we are in the business of oxidizing CH bonds. And it turns out that all of the molecules of life, all of the proteins that are in our bodies, our DNA that encodes those proteins, and all of the molecules that we ingest in our foods and in the drugs that we take are oxidized hydrocarbons. So what does this mean? This means that they are made up of these very strong carbon-carbon bonds with strong CH bonds. These bonds, you can see, are making up the framework of the molecule of things like antibiotics, erythromycin, and they're really presenting oxidized functionality that's shown here in red to the proteins that this small molecule is going to interact with. So they really impart the function of these molecules. And so the question becomes, how do you introduce this functionality and what importance does it have? So this functionality, this conversion, this atomistic change of CH bonds to things like oxygen can taste the way compound, can change the way compounds taste. It can take a compound that tastes like oranges and convert it to something that tastes like grapefruit. It can change the way they smell, taking something non-fragrant and converting it to a powerful fragrance. And of course, it can take compounds and make them into drugs. And so here I'm showing you the archetypical examples of this, where this atomistic change here can take a compound that is non-toxic and convert it into one of the most powerful chemotherapeutic agents of our time. It can take a compound that is not a very potent antibiotic and increase its potency. So the question is, how do we as people that make molecules, as synthetic chemists, how do we introduce this oxidized functionality into complex molecules since it imparts such great function? Well, we do it through a process that's known as de novo synthesis. So we start usually with small building blocks. Oftentimes, they're oxidized from nature. And we do laborious, multi-step processes to make the final compound. And you can see here, what does 37 chemical steps mean? Well, each chemical step is a very time and labor intensive process, taking up to half a day or more sometimes. And so then becomes the question, is there an easier way to introduce function into molecules, to introduce this oxidized functionality? And in fact, nature has shown us a different way. Nature remarkably takes what looks like a forest of these very strong CH bonds and performs these atomistic changes, converting one CH bond to an oxygen and therefore imparting function. And so how is it that nature is able to do this? Well, nature does this through iron enzymes known as P450s that exist ubiquitously. They exist in trees, in bacteria, and they exist in us. So right now, if you've ingested any kinds of compounds like aspirin, that is getting metabolized in your liver and it's undergoing this atomistic change of CH to CO to make it more water soluble so that you can excrete it out more readily. So this process is one that chemists would love to duplicate. So why is it that we don't use these enzymes and why is it that we don't do this process? Well, it turns out that this is, as you can imagine, given the strength of this hydrocarbon core, this is a very high energy process. And so if you just let a hydrocarbon sit around with molecular oxygen, 
nothing will happen for a very, very long time. You have to be able to get over this energetic barrier, and for that, what you need is a lot of heat. So heat with oxygen will oxidize hydrocarbon cores, and it will oxidize them to many, many different products, ultimately leading to combustion, which is what happens when you put gasoline into your car. You combust it ultimately all the way into CO2. And so the question becomes, is there a way to do this more selectively? And enzymes have figured out that what you need is a catalyst, and that's what an enzyme is. It's something that lowers this activation barrier and allows you now to do this transformation much more selectively with actually mind-blowing, exquisite selectivity. So why is it that we as organic chemists, when we're trying to impart function into these molecules, why is it that we don't use enzymes all the time? Well, enzymes generally get their selectivity using a strategy of specificity. So let's say that I want to impart function into artemisinin and I want to introduce an oxygen moiety into it. I have an enzyme that has a binding pocket that recognizes the shape of this artemisinin, will bind it very selectively, placing one CH bond directly where that oxidant is, and that's how it's able to affect a very selective oxidation. But let's say, as a chemist who's trying to discover function, I don't want to just only look at artemisinin, I also would like to look at something like an erythromycin precursor. All of a sudden, this has a very different shape than this, so the enzyme with this binding pocket that was created for this molecule will no longer work for erythromycin. And so I have to develop now an entirely new enzyme for this process, and this might be great if you have a specific molecule in mind that you would like to oxidize in a specific place and introduce function to, but if you're someone who's in the business of discovering function by exploring a lot of different small molecules and a lot of different positions where you would like to introduce oxidized functionality, this strategy really is very limiting and can't work. And so really when we started in this area, you know, people that were considered giants in this field um, wrote very daunting review articles, kind of saying, as Paul said, that this was really not possible that really there were very little differences between CH bonds in terms of their reactivity, and so trying to achieve selectivity outside the realm of enzymes was not going to really be possible without using that specific paradigm. So they really viewed CH bonds as, as you might when you first look at them in these structures, the way that you would view trees in a forest from an airplane, from an aerial view. You would look down and you would think, oh my gosh, I could never distinguish one tree from another tree. However, if you have the right tools, you might be able to. And so if you, of course, have binoculars, you might see that these trees actually exist in different environments. Some trees may be next to waterfalls. Other trees may be next to lakes. Some trees may be next to mountains. And so, this is the realization that we had, that CH bonds that look indistinguishable, that if you take a closer look, are in different environments themselves. They're in different electronic environments, different steric environments, different stereoelectronic environments. And if you have the right tool, the right catalyst that can distinguish these differences, you can get very high selectivity, with generality, because all molecules have these types of features. All complex molecules have these types of features. And so with this, we discovered this catalyst, iron PDP, which now selects for the most electron-rich, most sterically unencumbered, and stereoelectronically activated CH bond in complex molecules across a range of different complex molecules. Of course, I did not do this chemistry myself. This chemistry was done entirely by one very, very talented graduate student, my first student, Mark Chen, who was the one that discovered this catalyst and had the courage 
to join the group of an assistant professor who was telling him things that he was reading in the literature in journals like Nature um, that were impossible by leaders of the field at the time. So a lot of credit uh, should be given to this very, very courageous student. So as Paul said, I really love a challenge. And when these papers came out, a lot of people in the community challenged us once again. They said, eh, this is OK. But you know what? What if I don't really want to oxidize in the spot that is the most electron rich, sterically unencumbered? Um, you know, really, it's the molecule that is dictating where this oxidation is happening. It's really not that much um, with respect to the catalyst. We disagreed with this, and a very talented graduate student, Paul Gorminsky, um, sort of bought into my idea that we could modify this catalyst now to place greater emphasis on one of these environmental features, if you will, of CH bonds than the other, specifically with respect to sterics. And so we discovered CF3PDP that it now allows you to take the same molecule and oxidize it in a different site because it weighs one of these environmental factors more strongly than the other. And this is Paul Gorminsky, who made this tremendous discovery. So then again, we were challenged. And this time, it came from the pharmaceutical industry that said, hey, you know, we would love to use this chemistry. However, we see that this very strong oxidant can't tolerate types of functionalities that are very prevalent in pharmaceuticals, which are pi functionality that exists in aromatic rings. These are more sensitive to oxidation, so how can you possibly come up with a catalyst that can oxidize this very strong CH bond in the presence of something that is much more oxidatively labile? And again, I was very fortunate to have an extraordinary student that was bold and brave enough to take on this challenge. And what he ultimately discovered was that switching the metal from iron to manganese, which is something that nature never uses to do really these kinds of oxidations, allowed us to get this very strong CH bond oxidation to happen in the presence of this much more labile pi functionality. So with this, we have really kind of started a new area which is now a very popular one called late stage functionalization, where a lot of pharmaceutical companies and a lot of academics are very excited about using our chemistry and the chemistry of others that is emerging to be able to do these atomistic changes on complex molecules to potentially look for new function. And so here are some examples from others in the community using iron PDP to do these types of late stage oxidation. We have since partnered up with Pfizer, and we've shown other ways that you can create diversity using this type of catalysis, as nature does. You can take, for example, one peptide, and you can create eight different peptides. If you were going to do this a conventional synthetic organic chemistry way, you would do eight de novo syntheses including synthesizing these unnatural amino acids in optically pure form. And this has led to molecules that we are currently testing. And again, this is work that a very, very great student in my group, Tommy Osberger, along with the postdoctoral fellow, Don Rovness, pioneered. This was very, very challenging work to work on these new, very complicated scaffolds that we had never worked on before. So now, with these catalysts at hand, we have shown a different paradigm that you can, now with these man-made catalysts, have high levels of selectivity, and it can be predictable. But now, unlike enzymes, it doesn't have to be specific. It can be general. And we've shown now that you can span across the range of every known type of natural product out there, and now increasing numbers of pharmaceuticals. Of course, this effect in nature is CH to CO, but it doesn't have to be CH to CO. So pioneers have shown, like Paul Hergenrother, that introducing amines, doing this atomistic change of CH to CN, can dramatically change the biological potency and efficacy of molecules. And in the pharmaceutical business, this idea of taking a CH and converting it to methyl 
has even its own name. It's called the magic methyl effect because it has magical effects on boosting the potency of these drugs. Currently, these types of transformations are being done again through lengthy de novo syntheses, really limiting how many compounds you can evaluate at a time, knowing that you have to start from scratch to introduce this methyl group. So as Paul mentioned, we're very excited about this new paper, which allows you now to take CH bonds and convert them directly to methyl for the first time in a range of complex molecules, complex natural products, and complex pharmaceuticals like this tenzolid. And so this was the discovery of two very talented students that are currently in my group, Kaiho and Rondi. And this is a selfie that we took the day that we found the paper was accepted into nature, um, you know, thanks to, to Rondi's ur urgency to capture the moment and, and really um, be very excited about that. So with respect to CH to CN, we have had to discover new catalyst frameworks these are thalassines, they're beautifully colored compounds that are typically used as dyes. Um, and a very talented student in my group, Shauna Paradigm, introduced these into the realm of some really exciting catalysis where now you can take CH bonds and convert them to CN, again, in a lot of very pharmaceutically relevant compounds and natural products. So Shauna Paradigm was the one that came into the group and even though no one had experience in this type of chemistry, really pioneered it and discovered these very interesting catalysts for which there is a catalyst named after her for. And then a very talented postdoctoral fellow, Joe Clark, came into the group and really made this chemistry much more general, discovering a variant of this catalyst, which is also named after him. And both of these catalysts are commercially available. So we're also very, very interested in this idea of taking things that nature makes a lot of, um, so feedstocks, things that come from, for example, petroleum, and converting them into very valuable chemicals, commodity chemicals, intermediates towards pharmaceuticals and natural products. And so for this, we've discovered a series of sulfoxide palladium catalysts that can now take this very simple, inert, bulk commodity chemical alpha hydrocarbons and convert them to these range of different very complex compounds. And so for this, I have to mention my first graduate student, Ken Fraunhofer, who even though we didn't discover this catalyst, really showed us how to use this catalyst. So he was the first to show us how to do allylic animations and actually how to show the world how to do allylic animations. This was a groundbreaking paper for doing this kind of reaction preferably for the first time. And then nearly a decade later, two very talented graduate students, Wei Lu and Stephen Amon, introduced us to SOX catalysis, which now enables us to do these transformations and ones we had never dreamed possible with much more selectivity and much broader scope. So I've shown you these reactions, and now the same people that were pointing out to me the Nature paper in 2007 saying that this was impossible are now writing their own reviews on this topic saying, in fact, it is possible, and here's how it's possible. So this has been extremely gratifying, I have to say, <laughs> <laughs> seeing, seeing this in the literature. Um, so you know, I've shown you, you know, some um, specific examples of students, and I hope I've, you've been able to see through the slideshow that's been going on before my talk, um, other students. So this has really been a collective group effort um, and you know, these are, are the students that have contributed to all of this work. Um, so in thinking about how to describe my students, um, I would certainly say that they are some of the smartest people that I've ever met. I would say that they are very, very driven, very dedicated, very hardworking. But I think the one sort of word that I would use to describe them is that they're really fearless. Hmm. And so even though I can't tell you all of their stories, I can sort of tell you mine and as their leader, maybe give you some insight into kind of how we think about things um, in our group. So um, I would say that, uh, you know, my family is really a family of outsiders in, in the best possible way you can think of using that term. 
So my grandfather, who's here, Faras Kebas Podrakakis, um, who was a Greek, who was born in Mani, in the Peloponnesos. And if you know anything about Mani, you know that these are very strong-willed, um, determined, <laughs> and stubborn people. Um, and he moved to Romania to join his uncle, who had a factory that made carbonated drinks, uh, along with um, two of his brothers. And there he met my grandmother, Maria Kojokaru, and uh, they lived in this sort of Greek community um, in Caracal. And while they were there, um, they were sort of known as the Greeks. Um, they had my mother, Maria Kisi, who was trained in Romania as a pharmacist. And uh, she uh, was known in, in Romania, of course, as the Greek girl. And she moved my parents to Greece when things in Romania became very, very difficult in the time of uh, Ceausescu, if you know anything about that. And uh, in Greece, when they moved there, of course, they took on the name of the Romanians, right? And so um, my father uh, was a southerner. He was actually born in South Carolina in a very small town known as Adams Run, South Carolina. And he moved up north uh, to go to school. So he went to Andover and then he went to Yale. And he told me that he was always called the southerner in these places because of his accent. Um, he then went on to join Goodyear, where he became a uh, plant manager and moved all around the world. These are some photos from Sydney, but then he ultimately moved to Thessaloniki, to Greece, um, where he was always called the American, <laughs> and he met my mother uh, there. And so then they had me um, in, in Greece, and I lived in Athens, Greece, for the first five years of my life uh, with my grandparents. Um, and. Then I moved uh, from Greece to a very, very small town in Ohio. Um, when I moved to, to America, I spoke no English. My grandparents spoke no English. Um, and you know they had never seen anyone who didn't speak any English in this very small town. Um, and so, of course, they referred to me as the Greek girl. And, um, and you know it was a, a kind of an interesting transition for me. So I guess what I want to tell you is a few of the lessons that I learned from my parents, right? And so the biggest thing, the biggest gift they gave me was this ability to be very comfortable being uncomfortable. So as sort of perpetual outsiders, they knew the value of this. They knew the value of bringing in a different perspective into an area and not feeling pressure like you had to belong to a certain group of people or a certain mentality um, to feel like you needed to, to fit in. And so this was tremendous for me, um, certainly in my career path, as, as uh, Paul has already described to you, so I won't sort of reiterate things, but I think um, certainly my ability to look at uh, leaders in the field who were telling me that this wasn't possible and say, eh, you know, I'm gonna try anyway, was really influenced by this, this sort of effect. They told me uh, to do something real. And so what does that mean, right? So uh, they came from countries where, or some of them came from countries where subjective criteria were placed over objective criteria, right? So in many, many cases, really what you said and who liked you uh, was much more important than what you actually did. And they warned me that you know, even in, in this country, that that is going to happen in, in some cases. That really, um, you know, your likability may be much more important than your um, achievements. But they really warned me and, and they prepared me to have my own internal metric for success. And that metric for success is directly linked to achievement and not at all linked to likability. And that has been extremely key because even though, you know, doing it this way, it may not get you a lot of awards initially, um, at the end, it allows you to create a legacy of accomplishments that you're really proud of. And so I feel extremely indebted to them for that. They also very much believed in this idea of Kant, which is that we are all really crooked timbers. Um, even though they're my heroes, they were certainly not perfect people. And I really am grateful to them that they always showed me that. Right, so they never pretended to be perfect. Um, 
who were always very, very open about their shortcomings, but they also were able to accomplish tremendous things despite their imperfections. And so the other very important lesson that they taught me is that really perfection can stand in the way of innovation, that perfection can sort of tie your hands because you're so crippled constantly trying to be perfect that you're not trying to be great, right? And so they freed me from that feeling that I had to be perfect. And uh, then you know, they told me that of course, all of us need to find a place where we belong and we feel like we can be ourselves. And the place to seek that, of course, is in your family and in your friends. And so I've been tremendously fortunate to really marry my best friend. Um, and the person that I really admire the most as a scientist and as a thinker, he's a tremendous visionary, Marty Burke. Um, and really, uh, Marty has taught me so many things. Um, you know, similar to my parents, but I think the most valuable thing that he taught me that I take uh, from our relationship is the power of forward looking um, and the power of positivity and how much that can really impact um, kind of your trajectory in life. And so I'm extremely grateful. And together we have, as our greatest achievement, um, <laughs> the, the two uh, little guys that are sitting in the back with my group, um, the Lagi <laughs> and the Lagi's. Um, <laughs> honorary group members, um, and um, you know, they are really the best thing that has ever happened to us, um, and they've changed our, our life completely. I'm also very fortunate to have um, a very, very supportive group of friends. Um, so the godparents of my children, um, two of whom are, are here today, uh, Dimitris and Holly Brokos, um, and also in this community, a lot of wonderful friends, um, two uh, women that I really consider like sisters, uh, Lena Sofronis and Maria Bulgaris. Um, and uh, you know, they have been like sisters to me and also aunts to my, my children. Uh, a really wonderful and supportive Greek community that even though we're far from our home, um, we are a sort of a, a sense of, of strength and support for each other and in family. And I've also been very, very fortunate to have um, amazing mentors and, and amazing colleagues in this department um, that really um, you know, are also some of my best friends. So I was very fortunate to just this weekend be at Eric Jacobson, my, my postdoctoral mentor, at his 60th birthday party. And uh, you can see here reunited with many of my lab mates. Um, these are the people that I worked with directly in my particular bay. Um, and you know, we were all really in awe of Eric, uh, not just because of the tremendous science that he does, but of the tremendous scientists that have come out of his group. And it really led us all to sort of reflect what was it about the time of Eric's group, what kind of things did he do that led to that. And certainly foremost, um, for me, you know, he taught me how to be a scientist. Um, he created an environment that was very scientifically rigorous, um, that uh, was asking hard questions all the time. Like one time at a group meeting, he asked me, why are you doing this? Um, who's interested in this, right? And so these questions forced me to ask that of myself all the time and, and try to continue to ask it in, in my own group. Um, but at the same time, he really inspired me to love science probably more than I ever had in my entire career. Um, and so it was really an awakening for me. And so I asked myself, what was it that he did to inspire me to love science as much as he did? And then certainly the answer to that has to be the freedom that he gave everyone in the group, the freedom to first and foremost to be themselves. Right? And that means to be themselves with all of their imperfections because all of us are imperfect. Right? And all of us um, working in Eric's lab said things that were stupid, said things to hurt each other, um, said things to hurt Eric, um, said things that were just scientifically way off. But we did it and we knew at the end of the day it really didn't matter because really the only thing that we were gonna get evaluated on is the strength of our science and what our scientific achievement was. And it was that freedom that allowed us not to worry about those things, right? Because we all know that we have limited energy and limited time. 
And so if you're in a place where you're constantly worrying about, oh man, did I say something to really you know, make my advisor angry or did I say something to hurt this person and, and they're not gonna get over it, um, you're not thinking about your science and you're not thinking about making yourself better. And so um, you know, I hope that I do that for my students. I try to do it and, and I can always, um, you know, it's something that I very, very much strive for because I feel like it's that freedom that really, um, you know, kind of led to the very special environment that he creates. Um, so here I'm showing two of uh, my closest colleagues, uh, Marty Burke and, and my, one of my best friends, Paul Hergenrother and his wife, Diane Hergenrother. Um, these guys, um, as many of my organic colleagues do, but especially these guys really inspire me um, and challenge me to really think about my science and think about the way that it can impact society um, and have a broader impact beyond publishing papers. Um, you know, what I can say about Paul Hergenrother is that you know, he is um, everyone's dream colleague because he really makes everybody better. Uh, and he inspires people to, to be their best selves. So with that, um, that's really what I wanted to say. Um, I do sort of want to end on this picture of my current group. Um, you know, Marty oftentimes says that my mother was the most patriotic American you will ever meet. <laughs> and, and he says that all the time. Um, and you know, I think that's true in many ways, and the reason for that is she really believed and kind of taught me to believe in the American ideal, which maybe is different than what you get in other countries, which is really that the place um, that you're born into, whether it be your socioeconomic status, whether it be your race, your ethnicity, your religion, um, your sex, that doesn't really dictate the opportunities um, that you have in your lifetime, right? And um, this is not only a moral ideal, right, but it's also a very practical one because hopefully throughout my talk and through these slides and, and through this here, you can see that really talent does not have a ethnicity, it doesn't have a sex, um, it doesn't have a religion, right? Talent is everywhere and we should capture it and, and embrace it and, um, and, and you know, do great things together. So thank you very much and uh, thank you all for coming.